Let us resume the public worship of God. Let us turn to God's word and sing from Psalm 121. Psalm 121, a psalm that speaks to us of God's protecting and keeping, guarding, providing, a theme that we'll return to in a little. I to the hills will lift mine eyes, and whence will come my need. I to the in our devotions this evening, giving us glimpses of the Lord's majesty and showing us the real nature of our own need, so that we will come not full but empty, not self-satisfied but very dissatisfied with ourselves, so that we will come not trusting in our own efforts, but in the finished work of Christ. That the glory may be the Lord's and not ours. We continue, O Lord, to confess our need of God's leading and guiding in our own lives, in our families, in our congregational life, in the life of the denomination, in the life of the church in general, what need there is for the Spirit of God to be at work, empowering and equipping, the wind blowing as it blew at Pentecost, blowing things in and blowing things out. Oh, eternal Lord, how we long for that wind to blow. How we long to feel something of the heat and the fire and the light of the Spirit at work in our midst. We feel the coldness and the deadness of the day. It's there in the community and it affects us like a cold frost that falls on our own spirits and creates lethargy and 
coldness in our hearts. Eternal Lord, we come and we pray for the leading and guiding of thy spirit and the presence of the spirit as we consider the word. We continue to bring before thee the needs of those who are unwell, those who are bereaved, some freshly, others with wounds that have their own reminders of times. Time passes, but all that current of sorrow, it remains there. We plead thy blessing then upon such, upon those with problems and difficulties, spiritual or otherwise. Remember thy people, Lord, and be very gracious to them. They live in a world where the fox is ever watchful for them. They are often weak, and sometimes they are careless. Sometimes, like Peter, they are full of self-confidence asserting that they would do this and they would do that. In reality, we can do nothing at all, but by thyself. Come, O Lord, and build the city. Except the Lord build the city, the laborers build in vain. Build the city of our spiritual lives. Build the city of our congregation. Build the city of the cause of Christ in Scotland and throughout the United Kingdom. And guard, Lord, what remains, what at times is very weak and ready to die. We pray, Lord, for those who govern us in Edinburgh and in London, the Queen and the Royal Household. We commit them all to the care and keeping of the Most High. We pray that they would rule in a way that would be good, in a way that would be wise in a way that would promote what is good and demote and discourage what is not. We pray for the society, confused and lost as it is. Our Lord, we pray that into this generation that spiritually does not know its left from its right, the voice and the work of God would come. And then everything will fall into its own place. Oh, Lord God, we do pray. We pray for the rising generation. And we are fearful for them in many ways. And what the world will hold for them. Win them early, Lord, to the Savior. And so that they will grow up as children of the Lord. As those who who are sheltering in him, whatever else life may bring their way. And guard them, Lord, as they come up against things that are so opposed to what they are taught in Sabbath school and at home, as they try to deal with these conflicts, never sure as to where boundaries lie at times. Establish them, Lord, and give them understanding, spiritual discernment, and give them early a love for the things of God. We pray, Lord, for the cause of Christ. Throughout our denomination, we have prayed for it already, and we do so again, remembering our mission work and our homework. We pray for the work of Christian witness to Israel and others who evangelize the Jewish community spread across the world. We pray for its work in Glasgow and Leeds and London and beyond our border. We pray for the work of the Middle East Reformed Fellowship in its radio and internet ministry. We do pray that the day may come when the Bible schools will be able to reopen and visiting lecturers will again be able to take up that mantle. The need is great, the need for teaching across North Africa, 
and into parts of Asia too. He favored the church under the heel of persecution. Many parts of Africa, there are difficulties, often local issues, that cause much trouble for the Lord's people. And in other parts of the world, it's national issues, national governments that hate Christ and hate his word. Lord, keep thy people and grant that indeed the situation, difficult as it might be, may be turned around. And that those who are foremost in opposition may yet become those who are leading the way in the gospel of Christ. We pray, Lord, for the armed forces of our own nation, those in the theater of conflict. We pray for those who are chaplains to them, that they would be true guardians of their souls. Pray for others who have chaplaincies in hospitals and in prisons. We do pray for those who go in into prisons and into prison ministry. We take the word of God in there to those who find themselves eh, perhaps at the bottom and eh, are at an end of their own resources. Our Lord, we pray for that work. We pray that it would be blessed and that people would come out of these institutions changed not merely changed by, by their own resolution, deciding to follow a straight line, but changed by Christ. And that indeed they would raise a witness in these hard places, and they are hard. Give them faith and give them wisdom and give them strength and give them grace. We pray for the, the cause of Christ in general. We are thankful for that Catholicity of outlook and spirit and embraces the people of God. Remember church leaders in these days, give wisdom and leadership, keep us from pride, keep us from self-sufficiency, keep us from man-centeredness, keep us from a cold professionalism, but rather warm-hearted. Grant that those who lead in churches would be true shepherds and true under-shepherds that they would be those who would put others ahead of themselves, that there was those whose gentleness and meekness would speak of Christ himself. We pray for those in leadership in the church who are unwell, and we know and we hear of many such, some even very locally here on our own doorstep, as it were, and others in the wider uh, work of, of, of the Christian church. We pray, Lord, for them whether facing treatment or whether knowing the limitations and the difficulties of old age and ill health. Raise up others, Lord, the fields are white to harvest. Send out laborers into the harvest. Hear our prayers now. We have acknowledged our sin, we do so again. They are red like crimson, they are scarlet, yet they can be white as snow. For Christ Jesus has shed his blood, and the way is open for pardon. Oh, help us to hate sin, to have tender consciences, to walk away from all that is ill, and always walking in the way of the Lord. Keep us, guard us, guide us. Draw us if we are far away. Convert us if we are unconverted. Touch us if we need the touch of thy hand. And all for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll read together now in, in the New Testament, again in the New Testament and in the Gospel, this time according to Matthew. <clears throat> the Gospel according to Matthew. We're going to read first of all in chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to take up our reading at verse 13. We're going to read just a few verses here, and the reason for that, I trust, will become obvious later on. Matthew chapter 16, and reading from verse 13. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say? that I, the Son of Man, am. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, 
and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And then in chapter 17, the following chapter, taking up our reading at verse 1, John, in Matthew 17 and at verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, bring them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun. And his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? Uh, the, the, the reference there is to that promise at the end of Malachi's prophecy, where he says that Elijah would come before the great day of the Lord. And Jesus answered, verse 11, and said to them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah has come already, and they knew him not, but have done to him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood. He spoke to them of John the Baptist. John the Baptist came and his ministry in many ways was similar to that of Elijah, his character, his personality. They were both desert prophets, unusual in, in many ways. So the Old Testament reference to Elijah coming back, Jesus explains it as John the Baptist. Verse 14, and when they were come uh, to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for his lunatic and sore vexed, and oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. But verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Albeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. While they abode in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Did, your master, did not your master pray tribute? He said, Yes. When he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, or prevented there, means um, it, it means being ahead of somebody before you can say anything. 
um, uh, somebody else has said something. So before Jesus, hey, Peter could comment on what had just happened. The Lord speaks first, saying, what thing is thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith to him, of strangers. Jesus saith to him, then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them without the sea and cast a hoop, and take up the fish that first cometh up. When thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take and give unto them for me and thee. We trust the Lord and follow with his blessing these passages we have read together. It is the word of God that lives and abides forever. We're singing now in Psalm 8. Ian Campbell, would you speak to sing this? Psalm 8, and we're going to sing the whole of the psalm. How excellent in all the earth, Lord, our Lord, is thy name. Who hast thy glory far advanced above the starry frame. Down to verse, down to the end there, you see that last verse, fowls of the air, fish of the sea, all that pass through the sea. How excellent in all the earth, Lord, our Lord, is thy name. The Lord's sovereign governing of all things how excellent in all the earth
my friends, seeking the light of God's Spirit, we turn again to that second chapter that we read, the Gospel according to Matthew, and chapter 17. Matthew and chapter 17, and we'll take up our reading at verse 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received the tribute money came to Peter. And said, does not your master pay tribute? He said, yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith to him, of strangers. Jesus saith to him, then are the children free, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. Go to the sea and cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take, and give unto them for me and thee. Well, as you know, in ordinary circumstances, this would have been a communion weekend, and we're still not in a position to hold communion, but as we've done before during COVID. We have marked the day nevertheless. And so I preached this morning on a topic related to communion, to Christ's suffering and death in the place of his people. And tonight I'm going to do the same. So we're going to leave our studies in Acts chapter two to one side for this week and focus on the words that we just read there. Jesus and the disciples are on their way to Jerusalem. That last journey has begun. But at this point in the narrative, they have stopped at Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was in Galilee. It's on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. If you think of the map of Palestine, you've got Galilee in the north, then you've got Samaria, and then you've got Judea, and it's in Judea that Jerusalem is located, so they're traveling down towards Jerusalem. Now, Capernaum was uh, an obvious place to stop. It was Peter's hometown, and it's where his extended family were living. And it was the town that Jesus used as the center for his Galilean ministry. And during this particular visit to Capernaum, Peter is approached, presumably on the street, that's, it doesn't specify that but that's what we understand from the verses he's approached on the street and he's asked a question he's asked a question by somebody who knew exactly who he was he's asked in verse 24 does your master meaning jesus not pay the tribute not pay tribute now, what was this tribute that uh, the man was asking? Well, the tribute was nothing to do with the Roman taxes, which, you know, the Jewish people at that time were paying to the authorities and which they absolutely hated paying. This tribute was nothing to do with that. The tribute was an annual sum paid by the Jews for the upkeep and the expenses connected with the temple. And you paid the tribute once in the year. And the tribute had its origins way, way back before there was ever a temple, way back in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 12 tells us, that the Lord said to Moses that when he took the number of the children of Israel, they would give every man a ransom for his soul 
to the Lord. And that ransom was a certain amount of money. Verse 13 of Exodus 30. This they shall give every one that passes among them half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary, a half shekel shall be the offering to the Lord. So long, long before it had been established in Israel that the half shekel was paid every year. And that half shekel is what this man is talking about. Indeed, it's sometimes called the half shekel. Other times it's called the ransom for the soul, just carrying exactly the words that's used in Exodus. And we'll say more about that in a little. But most often of all, it was simply called the temple tax. Does your master not pay the temple tax? Now, why does the man ask the question? Because I said a moment ago that everybody paid it generally. Well, that wasn't absolutely exact. It would appear that there were certain people who didn't have to pay the temple tax. The rabbis, the religious teachers of the day seem to have become exempt. They didn't have to pay this particular tribute or at least some of them didn't pay it. And some people, they come to these verses and well, they may be right. They say, what we have here is a genuine inquiry by this a fellow who was appointed to gather the tribute money. Does your master, who is acknowledged by some to be a rabbi and a religious teacher, does he pay it? Or is he in the category where he's not required to pay it? They come and they ask Peter, perhaps some say to avoid embarrassing Jesus himself, they don't approach him directly, but they take their chance and they approach Peter, whom they would have known anyway. Now, if we take the question in this way, it's polite and it's respectful and there's absolutely no agenda, as we say, with the question at all. Now, I have to say, I'm not convinced that it was all that innocent. The tide of popular opinion was turning against the Lord. And I can't but feel that there's an unfriendly tone to the question. That there's something of a criticism directed at the law. Does your master not pay the tribute tax? How often they try to find fault with him. And it is my feeling, or what it's worth, that that is what we have here. In any case, in verse 25, Peter quickly replies. Oh, yes, he said, my master does pay the tribute tax. And maybe if Peter detected an unfriendly tone, maybe he was a little bit um, defensive in his own reply, quick to defend the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyway, the moment passes. And in verse 25, we're told that Peter reaches the house. But before Peter can enter into any discussion of what's just taken place, there's another question waiting for Peter. And this time, it's the Lord himself. We saw already that it says in the verse that he prevented Peter. He prevented Peter from saying anything. Because as soon as Peter comes in, 
The Lord says, Simon Peter, I have a question for you. The Lord is showing Peter that he knew very well what had happened. That he knew very well the conversation that had just taken place outside. And we'll see exactly how much he knew in just a moment. And he asks a straightforward question. Verse 25. The kings of this world, he said, who do they take tax from? Is it from their own children? Or is it from other people? Well, the question is straightforward. And Peter replies, oh, he says, other people. That's what he means by strangers. He doesn't mean complete strangers. He just means people who were outside of the royal circle and the royal family. The king will not tax his own children. The king's family are free. His sons and his daughters, they are free. In verse 26, Jesus agrees. He says, that's right, Peter. And then he adds this comment. Then he says, the children are free. The children are free. But why does the Lord say this? What has this got to do with what's happened before? Well, the Lord is gently reminding Peter of the experience that they'd had shortly before this up on the Mount of Transfiguration. We read about it at the very beginning of this chapter itself. And there on the Mount of Transfiguration, they had seen something, a glimpse of the glory of Christ. Verse 2 of this chapter, he was transfigured before them. His face shines as the sun. His clothes are white as light. And then verse 5, there's this voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You see? See the connection? This is my beloved son. The children are free. And then he might have reminded Peter of Peter's own words in the previous chapter. Not that long before. And again we read of this. Chapter 16 and um, where are we? Verse 18. No, verse 17. No, verse 16. Sorry. Who am I, he says. And Peter himself says, the Christ, the son of the living God. Twice, very recently, either Peter himself had acknowledged that Jesus was the son of God, or he had heard God the Father say it from heaven itself. Peter you were asked a question about me just now and the tribute money. And you answered the question as best you could. But I'm going to remind you, my friend, who I am. I am the eternal son of God. Peter, have you not heard me call the temple that the whole tax was about? my father's house indeed peter as i have told you already i am greater than the temple so in truth i don't have to pay the temple tax i am under no obligation whatsoever it is my father's house of whom do the kings of the earth take tribute? Of strangers or of children? Then the children are free. But then Jesus does three things. He does three things. First of all, Jesus chooses 
to pay the temple tax. He chooses to pay it. He doesn't send Peter out into the street and say, go and catch up with that man and put him right. Because truth be told, that man would not have been able to understand in any real meaningful way what Jesus was talking about. He doesn't send him out to speak to the man again. He doesn't make a fuss. He doesn't contest the demand. He doesn't stand on his rights. Peter, he said, notwithstanding who I am, I'll pay the tribute money. And you notice it's very interesting the way he puts it at the beginning of verse 27, lest we should offend them. Lest we should cause unnecessary trouble. Now the Lord never avoided trouble. When it had to be met, he met it head on. But it's also a feature of his ministry that when it could be avoided, he avoided it. There was a wisdom in it all. Some things demanded to be met head on. Other things, says Jesus, are best dropped. We will pay it, Peter. Lest it cause offense. Lest they go around saying about me that I don't like the temple and that I don't support the things of my father's house. I may not be under obligation, but I choose to pay it. The doctrine of Christian liberty is very precious. And I don't give an inch on it. But asserting our freedom should not come at the expense of hindering the gospel in any way at all. Jesus takes the place of the servant. Although he is the king, he takes the place of the servant. And as the father's servant, as his people's representative, he comes under the law and under the demands of the law. Although the law ultimately had no demand on him at all, he submits to it. He pays the temple tax. He, who as Paul says in Philippians 2, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, he makes himself of no reputation. He takes on him the form of a servant. He humbles himself. And he pays the temple tax. Jesus chose to pay the temple tax. But then the second thing that Jesus does is this. Jesus pays for Peter too. Jesus pays for Peter too. Now we're not told if Peter would have difficulty paying his temple tax. People sometimes try to build too much into that. And they say Peter was penniless. And well, we're not told that. Certainly, he and the other disciples would have had very little spare money. After all, they had left their occupation to follow the Lord. So that regular income would have dried up. That's that much is, is obvious. No doubt. Kind friends would have helped them. But whatever the situation, whatever Peter's financial situation was, 
Jesus kindly and thoughtfully takes on the burden of Peter's debt. And surely, surely I'm not reading too much into it if I say there's an application here. And the application is this. Whatever Peter's situation was, and we don't know, we all lack spiritual resources, if I can put it like that. None of us has enough of ourselves. God's law says, pay me what you owe me. And in the face of that demand, you and I have nothing to pay. Nothing to pay with, I mean. But into our emptiness, into our lack, comes the Lord with his resources. And he takes the burden and he takes the debt of his people's sins. And what does he say? He says, put it on my account. I will see to it. I will cover it. On the cross, he takes their obligations. And he makes their obligation his obligation. At infinite cost. He could have said, Peter, your debt has nothing to do with me. I don't have to pay anything. I'm the eternal son of God. That's not what Jesus does. Ah, oh, that's not what he does. When he takes human nature. That's not what he does when he makes his people's debt, his debt, their condemnation, his condemnation, their sin even, his sin. He's made sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus chooses to pay to cover Peter's debt. Peter's bill. Peter's tax. What a parable. What, a, what an illustration of what Jesus was doing for all his people. What he would do a few days later on the cross itself. This is my body. Broken for you. And if he has done the greatest of all for you, Christians. You can be sure that like Peter, he won't leave you to carry your burdens alone. F.B. Mayer puts it like this. The tax collector is at our door with his demand. But Jesus will be equal to every emergency you can rely Christian on his care and his provision Jesus chooses to pay the temple tax Jesus chooses to pay for Peter as well and then the third thing that Jesus does is this. He arranges how it's going to be paid. How was it going to be paid? Where were they going to find a half shekel? Where were they going to find two half shekels if he's paying for Peter? 
Well, before Peter says a word, it's all in hand. Because as we'll see in a minute, out there in the sea, there's a fish swimming with something in its mouth. Your needs are all in hand from all eternity. They've been in hand. He doesn't react to your needs as you do, where you have to react suddenly. His provision is eternal. Peter, he says, go and get a fish hook. Go down to the water. In verse 27, he says, you will catch a fish. And that fish will have a coin in its mouth. Now, I asked a moment ago how they were going to pay the half sheik. And maybe you might have your own idea as well. They might look around to see if they could find something. Or they might go and ask somebody and say, can you, can you lend me some money for the tribute tax? This is the last way in the world that Peter would have imagined the money was going to be paid. Out of a fish's mouth. And isn't it the same when we think of the cross itself? Isn't that the last way we would ever imagine by which God would bring peace to sinners? And peace between himself and the sin. The last way in which he would arrange for sin to be forgiven. And condemnation to be taken away. The very last way. But it's God's way. So Peter goes. He goes with his line. And somewhere in the depths of the sea. That fish. Is going to have to take that hook. Another fish can't come ahead of it. You know, sometimes if you've got a lot of fish and they're, they're swimming together and you've got the hook, well, it could be any one of them that catches it. Get a shoal coming in. Another fish can't be caught. That one must be there at that moment. The tides are going to be such that he'll be there. The currents are going to be such that he'll be there. What were we singing in Psalm 8? Fowls of the air, fish of the sea, all that pass through the same. How excellent in all we are. Lord, our Lord, is thy name. At some point in its journey, this fish had caught a glittering coin. And before then, someone had dropped that coin into the water. It had to be this coin. As we'll see in a moment, it had to be a certain value. If someone drops that coin. We'll never know who. Maybe a child, a drop from a child's fingers. Maybe somebody else. Maybe something happened and somebody bumped into somebody and, oh, there it goes. Into the water and they can't catch it. It floats down into the water, this glittering coin, and the fish is attracted to it. And it takes it into its mouth. And this fish with a coin in its mouth is going to have to take Peter's bait. And Peter takes the coin. Now look at the coin. Is it a half shekel? Is it enough for Jesus? No, it's one coin that was equal to two half shekels. Enough for two of them. It couldn't just be any coin. It had to be this one. Isn't this amazing? You take that, Peter, and you give it to them. 
it'll cover what you owe. We see Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. We saw it this morning in John 17, John 13, 1. And he's in the upper room and he's going to break the bread and hand them the cup. This is for you, he says. Take it. You see him in Gethsemane. With the whole weight falling on him. And he's sweating and it's coming out of him like drops of blood. Such is the pressure physically and emotionally. This is for you, Peter. Take it. Take it. See him on the cross. This is for you. Take it. Take it to cover your debt. To pay for your liberty. This is the ransom money that I'm paying for you. In this chapter, he pays what's called the ransom for the soul on the cross. He pays the ransom for the soul of all his people. He paid the ransom on the cross. Though he was under no obligation to pay it. He had no sin to atone for. And yet he voluntarily pays. Just as here, he voluntarily paid Peter's temple tax. The poet puts it like this. Christ the true and better Isaac. Humble son of sacrifice. Who would climb the fearful mountain. There to offer up his life. Laid with faith upon the altar. Father's joy and only son. Their salvation was provided. Oh, what full and boundless love. Christ, the true and better Moses, called to lead his people home. Standing bold to earthly powers, God's great glory to be known. With his arms stretched wide to heaven. See the waters part in two. See the veil is torn asunder. Cleansed with blood. We now pass through. You will find a piece of money. Take it, Peter. And give it to them. For me and for you. Take it. And Peter reaches out, doesn't he? He goes in faith. Unbelief would have said, what's the point? Even if I catch a fish, it's what? It won't have the right money in its mouth. And this, that, and the next thing. He goes believing the Lord and taking him at his word. And he reaches out and he takes it. He catches a fish. And he opens it. And there it is. Peter does that by faith. His empty hand reaches out 
and he finds that it is enough. It is enough. And he comes to us in the gospel and he says, you need savior and you need salvation. You need redemption. You need the ransom for the soul. You don't have it. But I have it. You reach out and you take it. And you'll find. It'll be enough. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Eternal Lord, we are thankful that it is enough, that no more is needed, that sufficient there for the pardon of sin and to usher in peace with God. O oh, eternal Lord, we give thanks that it is enough. We give thanks for that provision from all eternity. Help us to take our empty hands and reach out and find that it is enough. He has paid. He has provided. He has arranged. Christ the true and better Isaac, and the true and better Moses, call to lead his people home. Go before us throughout the week. Pardon our sin, especially in holy things. Take away our sin and go before us, preparing us for all that's prepared for us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, normally on a communion Sabbath, we would have sung Psalm 72. We'll do so now and we'll sing from verse 16. We'll sing from the middle of verse 16. The city shall be flourishing, her citizens abound. The number shall like to the grass that grows upon the ground. And then it speaks of his name enduring forever. In verse 18, it speaks of him alone doing wondrous works in glory that excel. And even supposing all we had was the wondrous work in this chapter, that alone is a wondrous work in glory that excel. The city shall be flourishing. The city
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all now and forever. Amen. Well, in a quick word, the intimation.